This video is part 9 in a series about Super Nintendo Entertainment System features. The SNES's CPU allowed for a 24-bit address space, and here we'll see exactly how it is used and how each component gets mapped to regions of memory. Afterwards, there will be a brief overview of the interrupt vectors and how they are used. There are many components of the Super Nintendo architecture that need to be accessible by the CPU. This includes things like memory, work RAM, video RAM, object attribute memory, color graphics RAM, audio RAM, save RAM, and any coprocessor memory, the game's ROM image, any CPU, PPU, and coprocessor control registers, or joypad registers. Like mentioned in a previous video, most of these are memory-mapped input-output devices. This means that a portion of the SNES's address space is reserved to access each region. The address space is 24 bits wide. This allows for 2 to the 24, or 16,777,216 different locations to allocate to any and all of these different things. The benefit of memory mapping is that the CPU can treat all of them the same. In Part 7 about DMA, we saw that accessing data from OAM, CGRAM, or VRAM required using a handful of special registers to write and read data to and from these areas. However, with things like WorkRAM, SaveRAM, or Cartridge ROM, data can be read and written just by using a certain 24-bit address that maps to that area. Take this code for example. Even though all of these instructions are just referencing some location in the 24-bit address space, they refer to a PPU register, work RAM, ROM, and save RAM respectively. This video will explain how the address space is divvied up between all of the different types of memory. Before looking at how memory is mapped, let's look at the address space itself first. Each location of this 24-bit address space refers to a single 8-bit byte. So address 0 refers to the very first byte, 1 refers to the second byte, and so on. 256 bytes make up what is called a page. You can tell the page number by looking at the highest four hex digits of the address. So page 0 goes from 0 to FF, page 1 from 100 to 1FF, and so on. 256 pages make up one bank, so one bank is equal to 65,536 bytes, or 64 kilobytes. Again, you can tell the bank number by looking at the highest two hex digits of the address. So bank 0 goes from 0 to FFFF, bank 1 from 10000 to 1FFFF, and so on. And then the entire address space is made up of 256 banks. This covers the entire range from 0 to FFFFFF. 64 kilobytes times 256 banks equals 16 megabytes of mappable regions. Here I've drawn the address space going from top left to bottom right, but most diagrams you'll find elsewhere will have this flipped upside down, so I'll do that too for consistency. To make some things easier to digest later, let's split up the address space into four equal-sized quadrants. Quadrant 1 goes from bank 0 to 3F, quadrant 2 from bank 40 to 7F, quadrant 3 from bank 80 to BF, and quadrant 4 from bank CO to FF. It will also be helpful to split all of these banks in half. The bottom half of a bank is from 0 to 7FFF, and the top half is from 8000 to FFFF. This is why I flipped the diagram upside down, so that the top half is actually on the top. Okay, this is what we'll be looking at for the rest of the video, so please get comfortable with this diagram. It should be simple to identify regions of the address space, such as the top half of quadrant 3, the bottom half of bank 70, or the entirety of banks FE and FF. The memory and registers inside the SNES console are mapped to the same region no matter what the mapping mode is, the first of which is the 128 kilobytes of work RAM. 128 kilobytes works out to be exactly two banks worth of space, and so work RAM is mapped to banks 7E and 7F, and it will always be there no matter the mapping mode. Now, the first 32 pages of work RAM, 
from 7E0000 to 7E1FFF is special in that it is mirrored. A byte in some type of memory or register is said to be mirrored if it can be accessed from more than one location in the address space. In this case, those 32 pages can be accessed from not only bank 7E, but all of the banks in quadrants 1 and 3. For example, accessing byte 7E1234 will access the exact same byte as 001234 or 9A1234. This is done so that at least some parts of work RAM can be accessed at the same time as accessing other things like ROM and CPU registers. Otherwise, the instruction would have to specify to access from bank 7E every time you write to or read from work RAM. The other things in the console are the PPU, CPU, and joypad registers. Just like the work RAM mirror, these are mirrored across all banks in quadrants 1 and 3. The PPU registers are mapped to various bytes in page 21, while CPU registers are mapped to pages 42 and 43. The manual joypad registers are mapped to bytes 16 and 17 in page 40 to remain backwards compatible with the NES, since this was the same address used for that console. And that's it. The rest of the unmapped space so far is available for anything else to use. Any devices plugged into the cartridge slot or the expansion port could listen for some or all of these addresses and respond with the appropriate data. While there is hardly anything stopping a developer from mapping whatever they want to these areas, there were some conventions that were followed. Side note here, this diagram is drawn to scale at the moment. To make viewing things easier, let's expand these smaller sections. Just keep in mind that these areas are smaller than they look. The remaining space can be divided into two particular regions. The first region being all of the parts of the bottom halves of quadrants 1 and 3 that aren't taken up by the work RAM mirror and the hardware register mirrors. The second region being everything else that's left, which is the top half of quadrants 1 and 3, all of quadrant 4, and the remaining part of quadrant 2 that doesn't belong to work RAM. By convention, ROM data could only be mapped to the second region. There is a special pin connected to the cartridge slot called ROM cell, short for ROM select. This line is normally high and gets pulled low when an address from the second region, the ROM cell region, is being accessed by the CPU. This line is used as sort of a shortcut to let the cartridge know that the address on the bus at the moment could be a ROM address and to send back some data over the data lines. This allowed for very simple circuitry for cartridges that only contained a single ROM chip. Add in some SRAM under certain mapping modes, or any sort of enhancement device, and this line isn't as helpful since these chips need to look out for addresses outside the ROM cell region. Speaking of mapping modes, let's finally dive into those. Most of the commercially licensed games released for the Super Nintendo can be categorized into six different mapping modes. There are many different variations of each mode depending on how large the ROM and SRAM chips needed to be, and if there were any particular enhancement chips on the board. The simplest of the mapping modes is Mode 0, sometimes known as Mode 20, or Low ROM. The first half bank of the ROM image is mapped to the top half of Bank 80, from 808000 to 80FFFF. The second half of the first ROM bank gets mapped to the top half of bank 81. This pattern continues until the entire ROM is mapped to the address space. The end result is that the ROM takes up the top half of quadrant 3 and quadrant 4 if it is large enough. The largest ROM size supported in this mapping mode is 4 megabytes. If the cartridge contains SRAM, it gets mapped to the address space as well. It starts at address F00000 and counts up through the bottom half of the bank. 32 kilobytes of SRAM will run up to F07FFF. Even larger amounts of SRAM will get mapped to the bottom half of the following banks. Now generally, all of the area left in the ROM cell region will be some sort of mirror of the ROM or SRAM images. It really depends on how the circuit on the cartridge is built, but in general, any leftover area in the top halves of quadrants 3 and 4 are ROM mirrors. The bottom half of quadrant 4 will also be a ROM mirror.
If the cartridge has SRAM, the remaining areas of the bottom halves of banks F0 through FF are SRAM mirrors. And then finally, quadrants 1 and 2 are mirrors of quadrants 3 and 4. There's a small thing to point out here that applies to all of the mapping modes. Quadrant 2 is usually a mirror of quadrant 4, except for the work RAM in banks 7E and 7F. A side effect of this is that if the ROM image is very large, some parts may only be accessible from quadrant 4 and not quadrant 2. The next mapping mode is mode 1, also known as mode 21 or high ROM. The main difference between high ROM and low ROM is that the banks aren't broken in half and shoved into only the top half of the address space. The first bank of the ROM image is mapped to bank C0, all the way from C00000 to C0FFFF. Then the next bank gets mapped to bank C1 and so on, all the way to bank FF if necessary. With this mapping mode, the entire ROM image is accessible from just quadrant 4. The largest ROM size supported in this mapping mode is also 4 megabytes. Now, if the cartridge contains SRAM, it will be mapped to quadrant 3. It starts at address B06000 and counts up through the bottom half of the bank. 8 kilobytes of SRAM will run up to B07FFF. Even larger amounts of SRAM will get mapped to the same pages of the following banks. And again, just like before, the leftover area will be a mirror of ROM or SRAM. The leftover parts of Quadrant 4 will mirror the ROM area in the banks before it. The top half of Quadrant 3 will mirror the top half of Quadrant 4. If SRAM is present, it will get mirrored all the way through bank BF. Then it may or may not also be mirrored to the same pages of banks 8-0 through AF. And finally, again, quadrants 1 and 2 are mirrors of quadrants 3 and 4. With high ROM, the ROM banks are mapped contiguously into the address space, but at the cost of not being able to see the work RAM mirrors or hardware registers when working in one of these banks. If working in a bank in quadrants 1 or 3, only the top half of the ROM banks are accessible. The next three mapping modes were reserved for cartridges with certain enhancement chips. These special chips will have entire videos dedicated to them, so I won't go into much detail here. Mapping mode 2, or 22 or 2A, was reserved for use with special ROM mappers such as the Super Memory Management Controller, or Super MMC. A ROM mapper allows for an amount of ROM that is larger than 4 megabytes to be dynamically mapped to the address space by only mapping certain sections of the ROM at once. For example, a 6 megabyte ROM could be broken into 6 sections that are 1 megabyte each, and then any 4 of these sections could be mapped onto the entirety of Quadrant 4. The ID22 was given to the SDD1 chip, and 2A was given to the SPC7110 chip, both of which will be covered in a future video. Mapping Mode 3, or 23, was reserved for use with the Super Accelerator System, or SAS. The SAS includes the SA1 chip, which emulates the Super MMC from the previous mapping. It allows for ROM images of up to 8 megabytes, of which 4 are selected like before. The SA1 chip includes 2 kilobytes of internal RAM that gets mapped to the address space, and the SAS also includes up to 128 kilobytes of backup RAM, which is also memory mapped. The exact memory mapping, along with the great capabilities of the SA1 chip, will be covered in a future video as well. Mapping Mode 4, or 24, was reserved for use with the GSU, also known as the SuperFX. Although all commercial games that use the SuperFX chip were supposedly marked as using low ROM, the actual mapping is much different. Games that use the GSU could support up to 8 megabytes of ROM, although only 2 megabytes could be shared between both processors. The GSU also came with 128 kilobytes of backup RAM, and up to 128 kilobytes of SRAM could be addressed too. More details about how these are laid out in memory and how they are mirrored will be, you guessed it, covered in a later video. Now, mapping mode 5, also known as mode 25, or x high ROM, allows for up to 7.9375 megabytes of ROM without the use of the Super MMC mapper or any other hardware. In this mode, quadrants 1 and 2 aren't mirrors of quadrants 3 and 4, 
which allows for more ROM to be mapped at once. The first four megabytes of the ROM are mapped the same as high ROM from bank C0 to bank FF. Then, any additional ROM gets mapped from bank 40 onward to bank 7D. You can see why a full 8 megabytes aren't available since WorkRAM takes up the last two banks of Quadrant 2. SRAM is mapped the same way as high ROM from B06000 to BF7FFF. It gets mirrored the same way as well, filling up Quadrants 3 and 1. The top half of the ROM banks from Quadrant 4 are mirrored to Quadrant 3, and similarly from Quadrant 2 to Quadrant 1. The amount of ROM mapped right now is 7.875 megabytes, but an additional 64 kilobytes can be mapped to the top halves of banks 3E and 3F. This requires a null buffer in the ROM image. What would have been the bottom halves of banks 7E and 7F aren't mapped to anything and are inaccessible. There is also one last mapping mode that is worth pointing out, but it was only used by homebrewers and ROM hackers. It is known as XLOW-ROM, and it is to low-ROM as XHIROM is to HIROM. The ROM starts at 808000 and takes up the top halves of quadrants 3 and 4, up to FFFFFF. Then, it continues at 008000 and fills up the top halves of quadrants 1 and 2, up to 7D FFFF. This brings the maximum ROM size up to 7.9375 megabytes, just like X high ROM. Like low ROM, SRAM is mapped to the lower halves of banks F0 through FF and mirrored to banks 70 through 7D. Then, the remaining parts of quadrants 2 and 4 are mirrors of the ROM in the same bank. Even with all of these mapping modes, there are still some spaces outside of the ROM cell region that never get mapped to anything. Other enhancement chips that don't require a special mapping are free to utilize this space to communicate with the CPU. This includes things like the OBC1, CX4, STO18, SRTC, or the DSP chips, for example. However, they won't end up mapping every single remaining byte to something. Addresses that don't map to anything are said to be open bus. See, when a byte is retrieved from some address outside of the CPU, like ROM or RAM, it is put into an intermediate register called the Memory Data Register, or MDR for short. So a byte from, say, ROM goes to the MDR, then to the CPU register like the accumulator. Even the bytes that correspond to the next instruction fetched from ROM go through the MDR first. If the address specified isn't mapped to anything, the MDR isn't overwritten with a new value, so whatever was in the MDR previously will be treated as the red value. In this example, the value loaded into the accumulator is the 3-4 that was part of the operand of this very instruction. This open bus behavior can be very odd and unintuitive, which is why it's declared as undefined behavior and should be avoided. The entire address space can also be split up based on the length of their wait states, or how quickly data can be read or written at each location. The areas designated for work RAM and its mirrors can be accessed at a speed of 2.68 MHz. The ROM cell region in quadrants 1 and 2 is also accessible at 2.68 MHz, while that in quadrants 3 and 4 can be accessed at 2.68 or 3.58 MHz. This depends on the first bit in CPU register 420D and only works if the hardware used in the game cartridge can support the shorter access time. Games that take advantage of the faster ROM access are said to be fast ROM, while those that don't are just slow ROM. Pages 20 through 5F of the remaining banks can be accessed at 3.58 MHz, except for pages 40 and 41, which are limited to only 1.78 MHz. And finally, pages 60 through 7F are accessible at the standard 2.68 MHz. Games with fast ROM should be sure to access ROM in the faster region instead of the slower mirrors. Enhancement chips can also map their interface to a faster or slower region depending on how quickly they can operate. The last thing to touch on in this video is the interrupt vectors. The interrupt vectors are a set of 10 16-bit pointers that define where in bank 0 execution should immediately jump to if an interrupt occurs. They are found at the very end of bank 0, 
They are split into two groups of five, one for when the CPU is in 6502 emulation mode, and one for when it's in 65816 native mode. The COP vector points to the routine that will be run whenever a COP instruction is executed. The BRK vector points to the routine that will be run whenever a BRK instruction is executed in native mode only. The abort vector is unused on the Super Nintendo, but would have pointed to the routine that would be run whenever a page fault or memory access violation occurred. The NMI vector points to the routine that will be run at the start of the vertical blanking period when the non-maskable interrupt is enabled. The reset vector points to the routine that will be run upon booting up or soft resetting the console. Note that the SNES always starts in emulation mode, which is why this vector doesn't exist in native mode. Finally, the IRQ vector points to the routine that will be run whenever a software interrupt occurs, and also when a BRK instruction is executed in emulation mode. These vectors are located in the ROM, so it must be certain that they will be mapped to the proper location in the address space. So, for low ROM mapped games, the vectors appear at offset 7FE4 in the ROM, while high ROM mapped games will have them at offset FFE4. Similarly, X low ROM mapped games will have them appear all the way at offset 407FE4, while X high ROM mapped games will have them at offset 40FFE4. Thank you for watching. You may have noticed the complete absence of anything related to the audio system in the memory map. The next video will be about the SNES's audio processor, the SPC700, and how it communicates with the main CPU to produce sound effects and music.